Nell Tiger Free has expertly played a mysterious and cryptic mother figure in Servant. Now she's bringing that same mystique to the first Omen. It's a prequel to the 1976 horror, but should it have even been made? A young American woman is sent to Rome to begin a life of service to the church, but she encounters a darkness that causes her to question her faith while uncovering a terrifying conspiracy that hopes to bring about the birth of evil incarnate. So it's kind of weird that we've had two very similar themed horrors released so close together. First, there was Immaculate with Sydney Sweeney, where she plays an American woman who travels to Italy to take her vows and devote her life to the church while having horrific encounters and visions. Now we've got the first omen, with Nell Tiger Free playing an American woman who travels to Italy to take her vows and devote her life to the church while having horrific encounters and visions. <laughs> Just because the premises are extremely similar, I and mean, I mean like almost exactly, the executions and the tones are very different. Now, this movie features more of a free-spirited and lighter tone at the start and then devolves into a disturbing horror. Free plays Margaret, and she's a happy and lively young woman who's grown up in the church, and because of that, she wants to spend her life in service. There's a lightness to her presence. I mean, she smiles often. She's somewhat bubbly while also being caring and concerned for some of the orphans that she's tending to. But she's also observant. I mean, this inquisitiveness leads her to stumble on situations that she's not quite ready for, like witnessing a birth that doesn't necessarily go as planned. Now, the way the film starts, it's intriguing, setting up a dark mystery with a lot of obscurity. Ralph Innocent is one of the stars who also kicks off the story. His presence is just wonderful for the little bit that we only get with him. In his raspy voice and his towering statue, it works to create unease and distrust that complement the story well. And there are some other great performances, too, from Bill Nye, Sonia Braga, and Maria Caballero. But really, I mean, the absolute standout is Nell Tiger Free. She is insanely adept at presenting a character who is filled with complexity while also being easy to read and instantly endearing. And just as Sweeney got to have this utter horror moment at the end of Immaculate, Free has one of her own. And the way this is shot, I mean, good grief, it totally reminded me of Isabella Gianni's subway scene in Possession. The sequence in the first omen, I mean, it is lengthy, unbroken, and guttural. And the way Free executes this pivotal scene is just expertly crafted, and it truly morphs her mindset and behavior into something unnerving. Now, I think with the storyline and character arcs, most everything, very predictable. The supposed twists, they're not shocking, but they're still introduced and revealed in effective ways. And I'm impressed that the overt ties to the original Omen film are kept at a minimum, with only a couple of very obvious ones coming right towards the end of the movie. There was one line, though, that I really wish hadn't been said. I mean, it was just too on the nose, and it felt cringy. Like, the dialogue needed to connect one final dot for anybody that still hadn't been tracking along. Now, I'm impressed with the physical gore and violence we're shown. Most everything is accomplished practically, with very little CGI. At least that which was noticeable. There's some body-type horror that caused me to wince and squirm, and the visuals were very realistic and grotesque, creating exactly the physical and emotional response that they were meant to. But for as awesome as most of the sights are, there is a point towards the climax of the story where we're shown some imagery. I really wish the film hadn't done it. I mean, seeing certain things, especially in this context, can never live up to whatever our minds can conjure. And when the movie decides to make this one element visible... I kind of laughed because it just didn't come anywhere close to being as shocking, frightening, or disturbing as what my mind had cooked up. And sometimes less is more. For this, it certainly could have used less. Now, one semi-clever scene creatively uses candles in arches around an altar and then a painting to create a threatening and foreboding image. Now, it might be a little kitschy, but I enjoyed how everything was laid out to accomplish it. And then in addition to great visuals, I appreciate the jump scares, they were kept to a minimum. I can only remember one time where the scene attempted to make the audience leap. And then after that, if we're shown freaky stuff, we typically have to work for it. There's a part that takes place in this very dark room where the camera alternates between staring off into the void and then back at a character who is looking at that void. Now, this is a patient scene, and I was straining and leaning in to see if there was actually anything in the dark or not. It's a wonderful technique to draw us in and engage us to participate. Now, I also like that because the time period of this story is the early 70s, some of the camera techniques and the stylings felt as if they came from that era also. 
We get long zooms and pans across wide shots. There are also close-ups of people's faces in stressful situations just to communicate the dread or discomfort that somebody's feeling. But with those stylings, the film also captures the pace of some 70s horrors. And this is patient and slow through a lot of it, and I did feel the time more than once. I mean, I was still hooked, but if you are hoping for fast-paced terror and thrills, this isn't that type of narrative. Even though this is a prequel so we know the trajectory of the arcs, there's still a good level of uncomfortable dread that permeates through the storytelling. The atmosphere is created in such a way that we're drawn into the mystery along with Margaret. As she discovers horrifying truths about her surroundings, we're also discovering them. Yeah, I do know that I said that there's so much that's obvious from the get-go, but that still doesn't mean that we can't be taken along the same ride as our main character. And I think that's also because Nell Tiger Free is just amazingly charismatic in this type of role. I'm not sure how she's doing something that's not dark or mysterious, but for this genre, she's an excellent choice. So all in all, I was really impressed with the first Omen. Nell Tiger Free is stellar throughout, crescendoing with a jaw-dropping final act that is raw and entrancingly monstrous. With grotesque visual effects and a chilling atmosphere, this prequel stays true to its time period by ratcheting up the dread with supernatural darkness. And while the overall arc is predictable, leading to a dragging pace, the tension and stress the narrative builds to should provide a lasting discomfort long after the credits roll. There's a little sex, sort of, eh, some nudity, a lot of profanity, and a ton of gory violence. I give the first Omen four out of five couches. So are you a fan of the original movie? Are there any other older horrors that maybe could benefit from a well-made prequel? Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this review, please give it a like. Also, don't forget to share and subscribe. I'm Chris. This is Movies and Munchies. Thanks for couching with me.